Welcome to Spread Love in Organizations, the healthcare leadership podcast where we explore leadership with purpose. I'm Najee, your host, joined today by Rebecca Young, Corporate Vice President at FedEx Corporation and leads Operations Science and Advanced Technology. In her role, Rebecca is responsible for driving critical aspects of FedEx innovation and transformation strategy, including scaling up robotics and automation, technology, autonomous vehicles, decision science, and electromobility. She sits on the FedEx Strategic Management Committee, a C-suite leadership group that sets the strategic direction for the enterprise. As an expert in both advanced technology and logistics operations, she frequently speaks at high-profile industry forums, including Fortune, Word 50, Reuters Momentum, CES, the AI Summit Silicon Valley, uh, and several more. In March 2024, Rebecca was recognized by Reuters event as one of the top 20 trailblazing women in enterprise AI who are demonstrating real influence, impact, and leadership in large-scale enterprise AI deployment. Rebecca joined two public boards in 2023, Royal Caribbean Group and Columbus McKinnon, bringing to both her technology and innovation expertise and strategic perspective. She has also previously served as board of director for the Mid-South Food Bank between 2013 and 2022. And most recently, she is the author of What Rule: Think Differently About Success and Cultivate a Happy Life, a book that inspires readers to challenge the status quo, dive deep, think differently, and charter their unique path to success. Rebecca, it's great to see you again and have you with me today. Yeah, good morning, Nachi. So good to be on your podcast. I'm eager first, before going to your book that I really enjoyed, uh, I want to first hear your personal story from childhood in rural China to corporate boardrooms. What's in between the lines of your inspiring journey? Oh, I, I would say it's a very long arc. And uh, um, I grew up, like, uh, if I rewind uh, five decades ago, and I grew up in rural China without running water or electricity. And uh, really, to see right now, um, I am sitting as a, a Fortune 50 senior executive and a board director. Um, my life journey begins with uh, a lot of difficulties in early life that um, no money and uh, not even and, and not even enough food to go around in the village, but plenty of love. And then I went to uh, Shanghai uh, reunited with my parents at the age of seven, but that's a difficult journey start with me having undiagnosed dys- dyslexia and uh, had huge challenges in school, even being viewed as the most stupid kid um, like by the principal, which was like really harsh for a child to actually experience. And so I had a tremendous struggle trying to fit in. And, uh, um, and that lasted for many years until my mother, probably at the age of uh, 12 or 13 on me, told me the biggest life lesson um, she basically just said, I know you're miserable, but you're actually really smart. And if you didn't like what you experienced, you should fight with all your might. And um, if not, your choice is accept the reality and be miserable. Which choice do you really choose? That was a reckoning moment. Just made me realize, my young self realized that in life, you always have to fight and for a different outcome. So that ignited me. I eventually went to an elite uh, Chinese university, which is Fudan University. And uh, then that ushered in a very different period. I was an accidental English major. Um, but that was the early 90s when China was under through tremendous amount of opening up to the Western world. So guess what? English is the best golden key to um, career opportunities and to exposure. So um, I I did many interesting engagements, did management consulting for British companies to enter into the Chinese market. Then that somehow also, and as well as American delegation as their English interpreter. Um, and that really ignited my American dream. So 96, I pack up my two suitcases, had $100 in my pocket and a scholarship 
to an MBA program. And so that's how I actually just had the courage at that time to had a one-way ticket, which took all my uh, family's kind of um, savings. And my dad literally backed me at the airport, please don't go, because we did not know anybody there. And by the way, that's a one-way ticket. You do understand if you fail, you know, we wouldn't have money or means to get you back. But I was young. In my mid-20s, I was like, I wanted to pursue the American dream. I finished two years. I had my MBA, um, had a lot of um, landing a summer internship with uh, FedEx for as a marketing intern and I did not know that it turned into a 25-year amazing career journey and pretty much um, took me from marketing to operations to customer experience to advanced technology and eventually lead to the scene, one of the senior most position at FedEx. And so that's a little bit um, arc of my journey. And uh, um, it's, it's just incredible. Wow, it, it certainly is. And uh, you're, it's, it's really an amazing journey of resilience, grit, as you said. Uh, you, you said really strong words in your you know, beginning struggle to fit in and how I love it. I remember we had a conversation with uh, our friend Gail also, and I, I wrote down actually what you said that you said again today, like at your lowest point of your life, you have a choice, mm-hmm. accept it and stay miserable or fight and change it. And I think this is part of the thread you keep in the book. So if we go uh, to, uh, to to your book, What Rules, uh, tell us more about it. Tell us uh, an overview and why you wrote it. Uh, to, to start with, and then we can go and dig into the rules themselves. Yeah, that's a really a, a great question, Naji. Um, first of all, I mean, I never really imagined I would write a book. And what motivates me was one of a conversation I had with another executive. And uh, when uh, he told me he wrote a book to multiply the kind of uh, reach and effect, and that inspired me to say, there are many people I feel fortunate in my life and my way of paying it forward is to share wisdom, share lessons learned, to inspire others to be their best. And so that was the motivation to write a book. And uh, you may ask like, why the name, what rules? Gail actually had a huge part to it. Um, she has been my amazing executive coach. So one day we were just having dinner and she asked a genuine question to me, uh, which is, Rebecca, you know, um, everybody, I mean, how you, what you accomplish is very huge. And even for some Native Americans, that's harder to achieve to your level. And uh, especially as women in the U.S., we always need to follow specific rules and specific ways of working in corporate. So how did you, as a person coming from trying to figure out the rules and uh, uh, just advance. And I was very stunned by her question. So I, the next two words came out of my mouth was, what rules? Am I supposed to follow any rules? <laughs> and uh, it took Gail by surprise. And it, I think she couldn't, she burst into laughter and couldn't stop for a few minutes. And then she re- recognized, she said, oh my God, you break the glass ceiling because you did not really like, like view the those rules as constraint. You don't un- even understand it. So by not understanding, you, you played your own game. And that's how you break through. And that really inspired me to use word rules as a book, a book name because I think in life, a lot of times there are tons of see like uh, good meaning rules that uh, guide how we do and and what who we should become but in the end we kind of live our life by someone else's rules by the conventional rules and uh, I always believe like life is too short to live based on other people's expectations and uh, um, it should always like be much more fun and fulfilling to embrace yourself live a genuine, authentic life, and uh, and not following any of those rules. I mean, for example, I just not to give you one example. I would say if you ask most people, what is your goal? 
like what what is your goal in corporate? And most people will say make lots of money, <laughs> climb the corporate ladders, right? I, our success tends to be defined by conventional rules as uh, the wealth and the social standards, but very seldom did people ask, is that your real goal? I mean, what is your real goal in in life? And uh, um, even for the industries you pursue or the business you do, are you really genuinely happy? So those are the kind of more profound, the common questions I explore in the book. And uh, not to, to preach any ideas, but as a genuine kind of sharing and exploration to say, let's dig deeper, let's dive in. Let's figure out like our passion and what we want to do in life. So let's let's dive deeper and talk about what rules. I love the title and and the story. And I remember you said break the um, breaking the glass ceiling. I remember you used the term also uh, in the book and in our discussion, break the bamboo ceiling, uh, as it relates, uh, I think, to what you live. But let's go there. Let's talk about the six rules you have in the book. Can you share them first with us, and then we can probably dig in one in particular uh, that you think we should prioritize above any other. Yeah, so I identified the six rules we commonly follow. And there are the goals rule, the strength rule, the opportunity rule, the limit rule, the either or rule, and uh, the happiness rule. So starting with the goals, typically in by any normal convention, especially Asian culture, the success of a life goal is to make lots of money and achieve high social status. And what we, if we dig deeper, sometimes we could achieve those goals, but miss the mark. Does that really make us happy? What is our passion? So the goals rule is really trying to dig deeper into our inner self, the, our passion, because when we start our passion, and our life naturally project to a more happy and fulfilling path. And the second part rule is the strength rule. And uh, uh, particularly as a female, and, and we tend to have a tendency of the negative bias. Like every time we have a survey about ourselves, like my my mind will immediately go into like, ignore all the, all the good things that about me. What are the, the kind of weaknesses and immediately dive in? And that's pretty good. That helps me address some of the weaknesses. But gradually in life, I realized that if I spend all my time addressing only the weaknesses, I miss the opportunity of like exemplify my, like uh, amplify my strengths so I can break through. And for example, my current role is a very unique role at the intersection of technology and application. That is where I find um, the strengths actually project me to a totally different space. You have a ton of technology like executives, you have a ton of operations executives, but the combination of the two brings more power because the intersection of technology and business application is where the value is generated. So that teaches me the lesson about don't spend all the time trying to address your weaknesses but you want to make sure weakness doesn't become an object of your success, but you need to actually spend more energy to amplify the strength, so to break up and to get unstuck. Um, the third rule, which is opportunity rules, and in a nutshell, we always say opportunity is luck. But there, is it really? So I would say two things. Um, one is, do you recognize when the opportunity actually show up? Second is, do you have the courage to take the opportunity? Because that comes with risk, right? So dig deeper. And oftentimes that builds, if you're clear about your passion and your strengths, then you are more likely to recognize the right opportunity and be willing to take the risk. And the fourth rule, interestingly, is limits rule or the failure rule. By taking the opportunity, you may fail at some point. And then doubt the, the select decisions we make. And we, I, what I, I want to share from my experience is limit or failure is temporary. If you don't try hard enough and fail at something and always in the zone, then 
that's very hard to break through. That's more like a comfort zone, right? So we needed to actually be more intentional about pushing the boundaries, pushing the limits, and not be governed by, okay, that's a safe zone. So that's a force on uh, high level is a force rule. The last, then the fifth one is easy or rule, which is something we always struggle is, um, do we will have a work-life balance? And uh, as a mother, as a woman, and I struggled with that at the beginning, I had a very unique past that I literally at FedEx, I, I would say it's two, um, I would divide it in half. So the first 10 years I spent as a mother raising two young children, and I did not intentionally go for a promotion because I was trying to really uh, weigh what my priority in life, which is um, being the best mother I can to my kids and spend time with them. And that that is because I couldn't reverse my kids' age. I can always pick up my career, but I couldn't. At the same time, it doesn't mean that I just like bamboo growing shoots. It doesn't mean like I'm just like stand still. I I spent 10 years trying to study every aspect about FedEx business from marketing to product development to technology to backend infrastructure operations, customer experience, etc. So I was using the time to build my strengths while spending a lot of time with my goals. So in the next 10 years, it just, it jump started my career. I had a very fast trajectory all the way to the senior leadership. So that taught me that in life, everyone makes different decisions, but it's about integration, integrating what's important to you along with career. So that is, a, it's not an either or, it's more like, a, can we find a path that reflect your different stages of your life, different reflecting your priority. And the last rule is happiness rule, which is my favorite. And so I grew up poor. And my my parents, the only criteria for me is, am I happy in that? That has such a profound like impact on how I view life. It's not being viewed as the status or the money. It's more genuinely, did I live a happy life? And uh, that also challenge our goal. Sometimes, oftentimes, the conventional wisdom is you grind now, you celebrate later. But do we miss the opportunity to view life as a journey, celebrating everything along the journey? So you don't like de- delay your happiness until you reach that elusive, everlasting goal. Like, because if we, we kind of have the mindset about delay now, or like a grind now and celebrate later, it feels like you always will chase the next goal because there's always someone more successful, more powerful, have more money, right? So I want to challenge that to say, if we're authentic to ourselves, can we really smell all the roses along the way and uh, be happy while growing, while challenging the new norm? So... That's in a nutshell about um, the six rules I wrote in my book. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing them. It's a lot of wisdom and powerful um, uh, powerful uh, pieces you gave us. Uh, I really want to dig into all of them, but I'm going to do the hard exercise. You said happiness is your favorite, and that was my next question. Uh, maybe not saying the favorite, but the one that you would prioritize above most. Is there one of them that you would prioritize above most as you think about your life? Um, I definitely thought like I would prioritize the happiness, like the in terms of the most. It's 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 more profound than just the the meaning of being just talk about daily happiness, et cetera. It's more reflection about what brings joy in life because when we are joyful, we are more productive. They always say find the job like which aligns with your passion, then the job doesn't become a job. Like yeah. you're so happy, you're so involved into it. So happiness to me is the summary about all the rules. It centers around that 
you live a purpose-driven life, that you find the right integration for you regarding what you are doing to your passion, to the family life. It centers around you have enough confidence and enough clarity that you are not swinged by a lot of other factors. Like for example, even I take teenager for it these days, a lot of social media impact. A lot of times you look at all these fabulous digital life of people. They have the perfect life, perfect body, perfect everything, perfect vacation, right? And that, that amount of pressure is real. And so in order to be happy, you have to really have a solid foundation about self to say, this is the life that's an authentic real life for me, that I, I am happy about it. And as we grow older in professionals, there's also a level of defining enough. So I love the book, Psychology of Money. And I remember there was one um, kind of chapter talk about a big yard party and with all the hugely successful rich people and this, but there's a writer there and people ask, how do you feel? He said, I'm, I'm perfectly content here because I have something they don't have. And people are like, how? Oh. He said, enough. I can define my enough in life from a material perspective. So, so that's why like I put everything together in order to be happy. It takes a lot to recognize yourself, your passion, recognize that the things you are doing aligns with your goals, recognizing you have the confidence to embrace life as it is, that you have the resilience, you have the grit, you you actually also happily like walking towards your goals and celebrating everything along the way. So that to me is a very profound kind of way of summarizing a happy, fulfilling life to say, do you feel like you're joyful? Do you feel you're happy? That's a hard question. So Naji, if I ask you, how are you happy? <laughs> I was going to ask you this question. <laughs> but you're, you're bringing really an amazing point. And I, um, you know, and, and that was my question to you. And I can answer also your question. I'm not going to avoid it. Uh, but but what... Is there any tips or what did you do or recommend for leaders as a work to detach ourselves from what, like the really the title of your book, like what truths, as you said, because I feel like several times, you know, we, we are in this craziness of doing it, doing fast, being ambitious, uh, trying to get to the next thing, making it good and even better. And when you get, you want to do more, you know? And I think for some of us, it's really built into how we function and within a purpose. So for example, I, I can share with you, we know one another, like my, my purpose is to make uh, life better for patients who needs it, developing drug, bringing it to market. It's really my purpose. But you mix it to ambition, and then it becomes, as you said, sometimes uh, you. I talk a lot with uh, with leaders where exactly as you said, you are in this constant pursuit of something that might be better at some point, and not taking the step back and say, "Well, let's enjoy each step of the journey." And in the several interviews that I've had with uh, uh, with leaders who have got to this place with really amazing careers, every single person told me the same thing we did not enjoy as much as we should the journey and celebrating the small steps that we've done that actually are way more enjoyable than whatever job we achieved at the end. So any tips or how do you do it to force yourself to change those rules, as you said, and find your happy place and your personal garden, as you call it in, the, in your book? Yeah, that's a great question. So I heard that a lot also when people, hugely successful people, looking back would be, I wish I actually spent more time enjoying the journey versus the never ending to go chasing. So I think the kind of mental model we can think about it is a hamster on, on the wheel. So you can always like move, right? And, but if it's continuous, you never really, that's a never ending goal. And we don't want to be that. 
And first of all, I will say ambition is actually great. If we're not ambitious people, we will not be where we are right now. So having a goal in life, have an inspiration, ambition is, is amazing. But, but don't view that as the end goal is the only place you can celebrate. You want to break it down to say, okay, if I am, I view as my life as, as a journey towards the destination. And can I just be more intentional about small wings along the way that gets me there? So for each step, when you're intentional, you want to be, um, and then you're happy. So I'll give you one example. Uh, there was uh, one summer I attended a, a famous consulting com company, uh, some, like one of the summit, and it was hugely successful people. So the first exercise is pick two cards. Like they have poster cards. One depict what you feel right now. One depict what you feel, hopefully, in 18 months. And um, never, like almost universally, most people pick now is like, a lot of struggle. You can see the images, lots of mad, messy doings. And so it's, it was almost universal. And interesting, I was at a stage, I was pretty content that moment. So I picked my first picture as a beach with hammock next to the palm tree. And then my next one is hot air balloon. They were stunned. I, they were like, that's your first image? I, I said, yeah, I worked so hard. I I recently got a promotion in the last 18 months. I got a promotion. I joined the two public boards. So I feel like I should have a moment of celebration before I chase my next goal. It doesn't mean I will stand still. But it doesn't mean that I would immediately discard that. It was like, oh, what's my next goal? So it boils down to be in, being intentional about celebrating those moments. Celebrating with people you care also, you love. Because I... The joy of my life, aside from a successful career, is my beautiful family. I have a loving husband, two wonderful children, who uh, one is a, a senior in college, one is going to college. I'm so proud of them. We celebrate in all the moment. They are proud of me. So those brings additional joy to that journey. As you're sharing this great example about uh, the picture, I, I feel like you, you were the only one actually who said this. And sometimes you have this pressure about, well, no, I, I have to be like, you know, this other image of, you know, struggle to end up at a certain time in a happy place where actually you're, it's a great reflection on saying, well, let's celebrate the small milestones instead of only uh, the the end point, which for many people like us, I think it never, like the end point keeps on evolving to be more and more. <laughs> so sometimes you end up like that's never rules, right? I mean, that's why I said what rules. The rules is you always, like the, the bigger the job title, the bigger the paycheck, the more wealth anybody gets, it's the happiest place. But the, the reality, if you challenge that, was like, is that really? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So can I ask you, uh, how do you, what's your definition of success then? You as I a leader and a person today, how do you define it? I I view the success is I'm a better today than yesterday. So it's the continuous improvement is the ultimate definition of success is life is a journey. It's about continuously learning, continuously experimenting, continuously be better. So if I look back today versus last year, I can see I, I have new skills. I, I actually mentored more people, help other people. I touch more people to be more successful. I advanced the technology for FedEx that actually will be hugely important for the business. I view that as success. So for me, the success, interestingly, is not a job title or the social status. It's meaningful progress along the way, as well as continuously improvement of myself. I, I guess that's a non-conventional definition of success. It's, it's a great one. Like meaningful progress. progress. It's it's a great one. Uh, uh, Rebecca, I, 
Another question that I, you know, I was thinking as I read this and as you were uh, talking today, as a leader within your organization, how do you apply those rules for your teams? So how how are you translating all this wisdom and developing your people, hiring them, managing them, growing them, managing their performance? I, I'd love to hear uh, your translation of this. So that is very important question is what the rules translate is create the most positive nurturing environment for team members to achieve their best, which means encourage them to identify their strengths. I mean, in my group, we do strength finders. So once you actually go through the exercise, you recognize everybody's strengths is different. So finding their strengths um, elevate them in terms of giving them the right assignment and uh, and give them a, like um, I think really stretching assignment that will take them outside of their failure uh, like outside of their limits and uh, experiencing new potential give them a joy and encourage them to embrace failures as opportunities so one of the for cornerstone of culture, I, I help instigate at FedEx is uh, quality-driven management. One of the key principles is view failures as opportunities. So um, if you view that as a kind of uh, guiding principle, then you give people the ability to fail small, fail fast in order to succeed and pushing their boundaries and limits. And so I... So all of these rules actually play very well at work is help team members identify their strengths, give them aspirational goals, and also as leaders, be okay with sometimes the failures. Not huge failures, but have the ability to tolerate the necessary failures in order to have a breakthrough is a huge like foundation for a successful team reaching their full potential. I would uh, love now to uh, give you a word and getting a first reaction to it. Okay, that's fun. So the, the first one is leadership. Leadership is uh, not, uh, it's about bringing the best from um, everybody. What about work-life balance? I wouldn't use the word balance. I think, like I said, the rule is the integration. When you look at the balance, it means almost like zero-sum game. When you integrate work life, you have a much more positive kind of attitude towards challenges and uh, um, just tackling the challenges and it makes the best out of those situations. The third one is touchstone. So the touchstone gives like a me and uh, I hope the readers orientation around the most important things in life. And uh, uh, in my book, there's a whole section kind of dedicated to that is exploring deeply, dive deeper, exploring yourself, exploring your passion, strengths, and uh, the kind of opportunities that excites you. And uh, that leads to better orientation about what we want to accomplish in life. And also, do the trade-off of what you can afford to lose and what you cannot. So making the, the decision that's most relevant to each individual. The last one is spread love in organizations. I think that's all about creating the most positive, nurturing environment, as I said, that helps people achieving their full potential. Any final word of wisdom, uh, Rebecca, for leaders around the world? Um, I would just encourage um, like listeners, if indulge me to read the book and identify uh, to, to actually break free from some of the conventional constraints and build a clarity about the passion, about the strengths, and also uh, have like charter your unique path to success. That's my final word. 
Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. I certainly recommend it too. And I love how you're framing it, breaking from the conventional rules that we've set in our minds and really in this pursuit of uh, of the breed rules we should set for ourselves. Uh, thank you so much again. It's been a real pleasure to uh, to see you again and have this conversation and congrats on your book. Um, thank you. And uh, my pleasure to be on your podcast. Thanks for listening to the show. For more episodes, make sure to subscribe to spreadloveio.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Let's inspire change together and make a positive impact in healthcare, one story at a time.